Well, welcome. Uh, good to see the afternoon crowd holding out for this <laughs> awesome uh, panel on rethinking the ivory tower, navigating future of higher ed. If you were looking for your post-tax results session, that's somewhere else, <laughs> by the way. Um, and, and you know, first, you know, you think about it, like, it, it, was this an ivy tower to begin with? We're going to explore a lot of what's happening with the uh, the issues around the the policy, the economic issues, the innovation transformation. And I think the one theme from our panel that you'll hear, and I'll introduce them shortly, is um, we've got to act. It's we're at a pivotal time. We need to do something new. So I'm really excited um, and honored to be with these amazing panelists. Uh, what I'm going to do is just go through and ask them. I, I didn't tell them that we were going to do this, so I'll see uh -huh. what the reactions are. But we're going to go. We're going to first go down the road, but that's not we're going to how we run it. But just go down, and um, we've got Ted Mitchell, the president of ACE, Dr. Jason Wingard, just leaving as president of Temple University, uh, Marjorie Haas, my new bestie, uh, president of the Council of Independent Colleges, Ben Nelson founder and CEO of Minerva at the end, and then I'll back it up for John Katzman, who I think, I think everybody at ASU GSV knows, a big innovator. And, <laughs> and, and he must be CEO. presented last. I know, right. I, know, I, know. I, I changed the order on him. Part of John's contract. <laughs> yeah, but what I'd like to do is just go, go down. We know what your organizations are, but talk about the, what you're focused on right now, Ted, and maybe the one word that, that you think about as you think of the current state of higher ed, and then I'm going to have you open more broadly, but just go down so we set the tone. Sure. Sure. So uh, uh, American Council on Education represents all American higher education institutions, all two-year, four-year public-private uh, institutions. Um, and that institution's word is really important because the thing that we're most concerned with uh, coming out of COVID is that we need to shift our focus from institution making, institution building, policies about institutions to students. Awesome, Jason. So my big word uh, is access. So, so many large urban public universities like Temple University and so many others around the country are really focused now on where their impact can be best measured uh, by way of access. And so how many students are able to come to these universities? Are they being prepared well enough in K-12 education? And we'll talk about higher ed in this panel, but how well are they being prepared in K-12, which leads to how well they are prepared to do well and to receive the education uh, in higher education. And then we'll get into funding and we'll get into curriculum, we'll get into apprenticeships and things like that. Sure. Uh, the Council of Independent Colleges uh, is an association of leaders of approximately 650 uh, colleges and universities across the country. They all share independent governance structures. They share a commitment to the liberal arts, uh, and they share a focus on undergraduate education. And then they differ in every way imaginable uh, beyond that size, uh, mission, etc. cetera. Um, collectively, most are small to medium sized. Uh, our Typical member has between 1,500 and 3,000 undergraduate students, um, graduate students as well often. Uh, but collectively, we make quite an impact. We, our institutions serve more than 2 million students a year. They graduate, uh, in many cases, the leaders, the future leaders uh, in, in every field. They, uh, we collectively um, support uh, student scholarships and financial aid to the tune of $7 billion a year. Uh, and we, um, we, we are looking for sort of the power of collective, particularly as we look to make innovations in the space. Personally, my passions and what drew me to CIC after a, a long career as a college president and provost was the commitment to diversifying the leadership pipeline. We will not succeed as a sector if our leaders are not representative of our students, and we are not anywhere close to that right now. And also the belief uh, that the power of independence as a vital sector uh, of higher ed is critical to the future of democracy and other things that we hold dear as we see more and more state level intrusion into curriculum, into student life, into who can teach, how they can teach, what they can teach. Uh, the independent sector has a really important role to be a safeguard of uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech. Noodle works with about 70 great universities, helping them with services and tech and strategy. Um, and I'm thinking a lot these days about, about the relationship with employers. And, uh, and we talk about it a lot. We talk about pathways. But both in terms of those 
of creating really elegant pathways that change the, the shape of overall enrollment, and in terms of lifelong learning, which is a tremendous opportunity for higher ed to be a part of, um, I, think, I think there's a lot of unexplored uh, joy there. Awesome. Um, and also Minerva. Minerva is uh, perhaps the only organization that is focused on global higher education reform. Um, we've done that uh, initially by uh, building our own university, uh, which just demonstrates what is possible when you rethink uh, education from the ground up. Today, uh, Minerva produces better than Ivy League outcomes for our graduates across employment, graduate school placements, uh, and entrepreneurship uh, with a student body that comes in five times more socioeconomically uh, diverse than an incoming Ivy League class. And over the past three years, we have begun working on implementing Minerva programs Sorry. at educational institutions uh, in seven different countries uh, around the world. And we're um, focused on expanding that and putting together educational programming, not only that is vastly more effective than a typical uh, university education, but that is actually enhanced as opposed to threatened by innovations like OpenAI and, uh, and others, which I'm sure we'll talk about. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. I think every panel is like, we don't get to in the first yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, we're doing something wrong. Ted, I want to start with you because you're a leader who has seen higher education from just about every angle. You've been a student. Uh, you've been in K-12, K-12-2, higher education, government, technology, venture. You've focused a lot on policy. Um, give us your current assessment. I'm not going to ask others, but paint the landscape of where you see things now. AC, ACE is, you know, convenes the most powerful, the most diverse institutions. We were just there at your amazing Thanks. event. Thanks. Uh, the future starts here. Uh, before that was AACC, Reaching New Heights. I did Unlocking Possibilities. We talked about this. We're running out of titles. But set the stage for where you think we are. You've seen it from every point. So I'm going to say the same thing okay. that I said last time you asked me this Perfect. question. But I'm going to twist it a little bit. OK, good. <clears throat> the worst slogan in the history of marketing um, was the state of Nebraska, yep. whose, whose slogan, mar marketing slogan was, not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Don't move here. Uh, go figure. Um, but I think that that's higher, that's, that's higher education, and it is filtering down to K-12 as well, mm -hmm. is that there are some people for whom it's the right thing, it's the natural thing, it's the good thing, and there are other people, hmm, I wonder what they look like and where they come right. from, mm -hmm. for whom higher education isn't the right place. It's not for everybody, which has a finger that's pointed at a lot of people who we know have been dispossessed, disenfranchised, and abused through every American political system since about, yeah. um, I think we can't say 1619 anymore. <laughs> so I'll say 1618. <laughs> and so I think that the responsibility for us, and yeah. we've talked a lot about it, mm -hmm. and I think that this is one of the things that brings everybody on this mm -hmm. panel together, is that We've got a huge access problem that has gotten deeper over yeah. the last five yes. to six years. Yeah. Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers of young people who are not coming back to K-12. Mm -hmm. um, when I was the uh, chair of the school board in California, the state school board, oh, one of the things we could count on was that the number of kids in California schools would go up every year by 4.5%. That's based the state budget on it, all the rest of that. That's not true. You talk to the superintendent in, in LA and he'll say, I wonder where the students are. Not a good thing. If you look at community colleges, the enrollments in some urban community colleges have gone down 25%. Mm -hmm. So these are people who are hearing the Nebraska slogan and saying, yeah, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. We need to change that. And so we used to think we were solving the access issue. We're not. We're now behind. We were, might have been on second base. We're now just right in the batter's mm -hmm. box. Yeah. So that's an absolute essential. Yeah. We have to prove to those people that we're worth it. And so once you get in, you got to get out. Um, how many people would run a successful business if 100% um, uh, of the people who come into your store want to buy your product and 40% leave without buying your product? Mm -hmm. eh, it's not a really good business model. That's the one that higher education has. So even if you get in, you're not going to get out. Um, uh, so this is a big problem. Um, one, the, the technical word for it is dumpster fire. <laughs> uh, and so we're trying to mobilize all of our members 
to get really busy on issues of access and issues of success. Yep. Great. Well, one of the things you said, and uh, Dr. LeBlanc was on the stage, he wrote the book Students First, was putting, tipping the model over and That's really right. focusing on students and value. Yes. I wanted to start with Marjorie and Jason. I knew, know you would jump in, but what does Students at the Center mean? Why, is, why are the independent colleges so important to that as well? Students, I, I think com, uh, completion is obviously has to be at the core of uh, how we measure student success, but so does access to opportunities. Um, you know, when you're on a campus and there are students who can't study abroad or can't take advantage of a special seminar or can't do an internship because they have to have a paying job, we still have not provided the access that we need and we still haven't made a level playing field. Um, every student should have access to well-qualified, well-trained uh, professors. Every student should have access to the technology that will enhance their le learning. And every student should have access to the kind of wraparound support that colleges and universities have typically provided to the most successful learners. I think we're seeing a bit of a crisis there. Um, the work of um, the student life side of the campus has become ever more difficult. COVID was certainly a tipping point for that. Um, but, you know, we're seeing increased demands and need for um, a lot of mental health and wellness support, for coaching, for um, information about how you get those out of classroom experiences. And I worry that if we don't find good solutions for those pieces, um, students may be able to get in the door they may even be able to get out with a degree, mm -hmm. but they are not gonna be able to translate that degree into the kind of world-changing, life-changing um, professional experiences that we hope for. Jason, you wrote, uh, if you haven't read the book, College Devaluation Crisis, you talk about both access mm -hmm. and affordability. Yeah. Your prediction is if we don't figure this out, 50% mm -hmm. of institutions could fail. That's yeah. just a non-starter. Yep. Talk to us more about how do we solve access and affordability and value creation. So, so let me underscore what Marjorie just said. So you mentioned paid internships, right? This is a big crisis. So when we look at colleges and universities right now, this year, you know, post COVID, this year, these universities, we are seeing more juniors and seniors drop out of college, not to transfer to another school, not to go get a job, just dropping out and going back home. And so when we start to look at that, we say, well, what is the problem here? We've done all this work to try to prove the value proposition of higher education, to try to remediate, as you just yeah. said, what they didn't learn in K-12 education, all the wraparound services and supports. So the time that they're spending in college, the money that they're spending, they're tapping out in their junior and senior years just now and saying it's not worth it anymore. And so how are we going to respond? What are we going to do? I have two, two daughters who are in college right now. And just in the last week, they've called and said, mom, dad, the best internship, the one that's going to get me the best job, it's going to be wonderful for me, it's unpaid. Yes. I need you to spot me some money for the apartment in New York City. Yeah. I need you to give me some food. <laughs> Can I use the credit card for the Uber yeah. and all that? But believe me, it'll pay off in the right. long run. Well, how many students out yeah. there who go to colleges and universities are able to pick up the phone and call mom and dad and have all that paid yeah. for? Most cannot do that. We have 60% at Temple University, 60% of our students are first generation. Most of them are suffering disproportionately because of the pandemic. It affected their parents more than it affected all of us on this stage. And so what we have to be able to look at is the value proposition for, for the students right now is not just the cost going into it, not just the curriculum that's gonna prepare them moving forward, but it's also us being able yeah. to keep them in school. And so that requires yeah. that we provide federal funds, we provide state funds, we, get, we raise money. We need to go back to a time when college is actually giving to the students, yeah. not Which actually just taking. extracting Agreed. and taking away from them. Agreed, and corporate America has a place to, pay that, to play there too. Absolutely. Those internships need to be paid. That's gotta be part well, of your and, business. Well, and budget. listen, uh, if, speaking from a corporation, I, all of my interns are paid. Yep. Through COVID, they were paid. Yes. So any company that wants an intern, pay them. Pay them. It yeah. will give back to the whole community. You have to pay your interns. Otherwise, they don't have the right to do what they're doing now, which is complain to the universities right. about the lack of preparation right. for the student right. pool, the talent. The job. Yeah. Yeah. Sure enough. Right. Absolutely. Ben, you, you focus on global reform. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you see in terms of the models that need to change. 
uh, around access, the pedagogy that you focus on. Like, um, I want to make sure we're looking, thinking about globally because students go abroad, they come into yeah. the country where you're studying everywhere. What does well, that look like? The, the, the problems that are, exist in the United States in, in many ways are the same problems that exist abroad. The, the, the enhancement of the American model is that we're, we, we do uh, arguably uh, um, the, the same kind of in-class job, but we uh, charge an enormous amount more for the privilege. Uh, and what you're seeing now is not only are students leaving um, uh, colleges at, at larger rate, but American students are now starting to opt out of even going to college in the United States because you're just going abroad. Um, because you can go to Germany, Netherlands for free as, a, uh, as an American student. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, the core issue is that the, the public perception of colleges and universities, and we, we have to acknowledge this, has plummeted. Um, we, the, we simply do not have societal faith in these institutions. And when I was starting Minerva uh, 12 years ago, I was talking to a bunch of funders to get you know, the money required to, to put this together. And I would spend half an hour talking about how we would reform the curriculum, make it integrated, get rid of course by course uh, instruction where it's all focused on uh, a, a, a comprehensive systematic thinking approach, change the pedagogy, make sure that students are actually learning, mm -hmm. change the feedback system where uh, students are incentivized on breadth of application as opposed to uh, short-term recall and depth of knowledge. And then at the end, I'd say, oh yeah, and you know, in our university, which is gonna demonstrate this, the students are gonna go and live in seven different countries during their, their four years. And mm -hmm. as, as I was doing this pitch, all of these Harvard, Stanford graduates uh, just you could see the smoke coming out of the ears and the <laughs> furrowed brows and the scratching of the head. And, and at the end they said, man, we do not understand why you give the pitch that you gave. You spend the entire time talking about what and how you will teach at a university. And then you save the only part that matters to the end, which is to get to travel and live all around the world. Everyone knows you don't learn anything at a university. Mm -hmm. And, and so it wasn't just that 12 years ago, there was a understanding in Silicon Valley, which I think is now a broader understanding in the world, that the concept of, oh yes, what I learned in college I'm actually using in life, mm -hmm. they couldn't even conceive of how classroom learning could be useful in life. Yeah. And, and, and we have been spending the past 50 years as a sector burying our heads in the sand and focusing on the symptoms as opposed to the root cause. There is a reason that we have an access problem in higher education. There's a reason we have a completion problem in higher education. There's a reason that when we try to address those things, we go about it in the exact opposite way. Because we've done miraculous work at increasing access and completion rates in higher education over the last 50 years for those born in the top 20% of the socioeconomic distribution. Right, where college participation and completion uh, uh, rates in, the, in society have doubled. We've done a terrible job for everybody else. And that's because when we focus on the symptoms, there's a magic bullet that fixes that for the wealthy, and that's to lower standards. Yeah. Yeah. You lower standards, access is easy, completion yeah. is easy. Yeah. It doesn't help actually fix the root cause, which is the lack of proper support and education and approach in getting people to actually learn and get through. John, you're the pitch hitter. Bring us home on the access issue because you <laughs> made a point talking about making the case. Well, there are two things. First, one of the things that's amazing to me is that higher ed apologizes on the one hand for not being connected enough to the workforce and takes grief from Ben and everybody else about, well, we're not <laughs> prepping people properly. And on the other hand, apologizes for being a force against social mobility because college graduates outperform everybody else by an increasing amount. And you can't have it both ways. You gotta pick a lane to crap all over higher ed. Like, are they not good or are they too good? And, and just go with that. The fact is that, that part of the war on science, on truth, is a war on higher ed. Yeah. We're engaged in that war and we're not firing a shot. Like yeah. there's no concerted effort. One of the things that concerns me that was almost my choice of word for, uh, uh, for Noodle and, and for uh, our clients is 
that we're spending every year more in marketing, that the cost of keywords on Google has gone up by 49% in the past three years in higher ed. As more people go online, this is a highly competitive space. Back in the day, we spent 1% to 2% of tuition on marketing, and now we spend 20 plus percent. There are people paying, you know, uh, uh, I won't name names, but 30, 40% of tuition for, uh, for marketing. I know. And there are people here who call themselves ed tech companies, but really they're ad tech companies. And, and none of that is having an impact because none of it's speaking to the value of higher ed and addressing people's concerns about this. They're all just fighting over each kid with highly targeted uh, 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 performance advertising that doesn't do anything for the brand of the school or the brand of higher ed. Mm -hmm. so, so that said, and I'm sorry for rambling. No, no, go. Um, I think very targeted things, like the pathways that I'm speaking about, are bringing kids out of community colleges who have their associates and took some math and science on a simple pathway that is elegant and clean, where they study for two years, get an accelerated BSN, they have a guaranteed job at the other end at a great hospital, who A, is, is where they're doing their clinical work, their practical work, but B, um, once they start full time, is paying off the loan at $2,000 a month. And it lowers the cost for them of bringing in nurses who are gonna persist it lowers the cost and risk to the student of taking a nursing program, and it lowers the cost of marketing to the school because now they're selling something that's free. So I think there are a variety of things like that that, that in a very targeted way can address some of the access issues. I'd love to turn to technology as an enabler because if you think about access, you get the, once we solve for access, part of it is the technology and access to pathways to opportunities. For more, I'd just love to get the group's thought on mm -hmm. what do those pathways look like? What, how are you viewing the role of technology in creating pathways for opportunities? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll talk a little bit about, about that, but let me also address one of the key questions, because it is a good question. Why is it that you know, there is such a decline in faith in higher education institutions, and at the same time, you have a you know, sometimes widening, sometimes lessening, depending on the data you look at, uh, gap in, in outcomes. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, there is, on the pathway uh, uh, comment, there are degrees, uh, there are careers, that is, that require certain pathways for which universities have a license raj, right? You wanna be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, uh, a nurse, uh, et cetera. It is illegal for you to pursue these things without paying for these institutions. And the problem is that if you ask 100 first-year students, uh, or you find 100 first-year students that say that they will be doctors uh, uh, at, uh, at the end of their studies, only five of them become practice doc uh, practice, uh, practicing physicians. And so the issue is, is that not only do uh, students have to go on this pathway, as it is currently constituted, but it is, uh, but most students that think they need to go on that pathway actually don't. So that's one area that stacks the deck in the favor of outcomes, quote unquote, for these institutions, whether or not they teach you anything to begin with or not. The second issue is the like-for-like -like demographic comparison. I have yet to see a study, interestingly enough, produced by higher education institutions that takes exactly same cohorts and demonstrates that the outcomes are differential, meaning same household income coming in, same IQ coming in, right? Same ne social network coming in, and then the delta that higher education does compared to those that don't. And in fact, the one study that we do have that's been running for 60 years at Harvard University has demonstrated that 97% of Harvard admits have the exact same life outcomes, whether they attend Harvard, attend another university, or don't attend a university at all. And right? you know, it speaks to what you were talking about before, right, about the differential inputs. And yeah. um, no technology, no business model for institutions is gonna solve that. We have to solve that societally, politically. You know, half of, I mean, Harvard, Harvard 
uh, students are much more likely to already start in the top, right? I'm That's confident right. that they can get good jobs uh, in their parents' company, et cetera, you know, without, without that. So, um, you know, you're not, you, but part of the reason you don't have much of that differential comparison is because um, part of what the value that families believe they're purchasing for a college education is a certain kind of elite branding and credentialing. And that uh, impulse, the um, impulse to not only um, make sure your children can access this sort of credential, but that you will actually hoard it and keep others from accessing it so that it doesn't diminish the value for your children is I think one of the most pernicious aspects of American higher education. And we see this in every way, right? We see this in the so-called Chivas Regal, um, which I have seen, I mean, as a college president, I would see this absolutely. There were families who would rather pay more because they believed that it was a mark of quality right. than, le than, than less. Um, there were families who the mark of quality was that their child got merit aid, independently of what the net cost was, right? Every private K-12 school in the country and in most charter schools brag about how much merit aid their students are awarded. But that's an artificial number because it's a, it, you, you know, you give me a number, I can give you that, I can get my discount rate that, I'll just change the price, whatever. So, um, so the whole way that we have of, of marketing quality, and those, those things are hoarded. I've spoken with boards who say, we can't, we, we want to, the institution says we're going to start this pathway from community college, and board members say, if we have all those community colleges coming in, won't that hurt our brand? It'll look like we're less elite. It will look like we're less important. So moving away from um, this sort of artificial measure of eliteness, which is, after all, all about inputs, and into really looking at outputs and transformation, I think, is essential. But the reason that's difficult is because, and we know this in so many ways, that people in American society who have privilege and power want to hoard it for their own children. So I can follow part. up on that, Marjorie. So I, when I worked at Goldman Sachs, it was about eight or nine years ago, I was the chief learning officer. So I was responsible for all the talent development yeah. at the firm of 33,000 people. And for previous decades, Goldman Sachs as the firm had looked at the elite credential, yes. right? You know, they took advantage of the fact and they assumed that the best talent and the best preparation came yeah. from the elite institutions. And so if you had that credential and you were stamped, then you could come here and work and everything will be okay. And what we started to see was that wasn't okay anymore. When global business boundaries began to shift, when technology started to advance at rates unprecedented before yeah. in history, when we began to see a lot more product cycles for solutions and programs and services start to happen faster at a clip, no longer did the credential matter as much. Now it mattered who has the skills and the competencies right. that are needed to be able to do the job so we can remain competitive. And so then you start going to other schools, you start going to the gig economy, you start going to people that don't have degrees anymore. Who can do this work? High frequency trading, whatever it is. Who can do it right now? So I've, I've, I've had a chance to talk with a few of you before this session started. So I just want to take a, a, se a second to mention, because some of you are still asking the question, which is pervasive at this summit. Is it the value? Is the value right. at colleges and universities, or is the new value at these disruptive companies, the investors and the disruptive platform companies that are trying to figure out ways to uh, provide competencies and skills and upskilling in a different way. And I want to make sure that I'm mentioning, and we've all talked about this as a panel, it's not either or. Right, this, is exactly. not a, this is not a competition between one or the, or the other. It's not a versus. It's a both and. So if you don't learn anything else at this summit, we right. need to make sure that colleges and universities continue to do what they have been doing, what we have been doing for the last 60 years. We do benefit society. We do teach people how to read and how to learn and how to critical think and analyze and all those things that make society what it is. You know, people who are good at, at that kind of thing. But we also need now in the market economy people who can very quickly gain new skills, new competencies, new advantages to how to solve problems in the future of now, in the future of work. And so the question becomes, how do you put those two things together? How can collaboration happen so that the traditional university model, which we're not getting rid of, and the new platform organizations that are disrupting higher education come together to form a solution so that the value for the individual student and for the employer is actually what it needs to be. Right now, we're fighting and we're asking the question, which one is better? And the value is being lost. So we're, we're spending a lot of time yeah. talking about the mission, 
of access, but then once they get into the system, it's not actually benefiting anybody, and so that's why we're seeing a lot of uh, dropouts. Well, and Ted, jump in, because you have incubation yeah. in, 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 you, at ACE. You, so. asked, you asked about technology, I think, a while ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I've got 10 minutes to, to say something about AI and chat GPT. This will be the panel, panel, but right on target. Right. <laughs> so let's see, some, a couple of random thoughts. It, the, on the elitist stuff, it is no surprise that some of the worst performing for-profit institutions are named Stanford <laughs> and Harv Ord. Hard. Right. Um, hard to afford. Hard to afford, um, which may be true of the other one too, but that's all right. Um, so, you know, it's there, it's real, and we have, to, we have to deconstruct that. And so one of the things that technology can do is it can move us from a whole series of proxies. Mm -hmm. I think that we should all be on a war against proxies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. The name of the institution is the biggest proxy of them all yep. because a bunch of assumptions then run after that. Yeah. The major is the next yes. big proxy. Excellent point. You're assumed to know and not know yep. yes. some things Excellent. depending on what you do. My son just turned in his, his um, honors thesis in history for which he was required to know Python, um, to present his data in Tableau, blah, blah, blah. But the world thinks of him as a history major, so he can probably tell you that the Civil War started in 1860-ish. Um, <laughs> but you get it, you get it, right? Is, it, is that these proxies, right. they hide the real stuff. And so one of the things that technology can do is it can help us decode that. And it can help us decode that by moving from proxies to skills and competencies. And that's where the game is gonna be won. That's right is in getting the focus on skills and competencies. So feed that back up. Um, uh, one way to do this is to ask, so what does Ted's son really know about computation? Well, that's a competency. It doesn't matter where he went to college or whether that he was a history major. There's something that he can prove. The biggest threat when you know, I sit in a place where it, the building vibrates when something threatens higher education, it's really cool to come visit. <laughs> Um, the biggest vibration was when Google started doing performance uh, hiring. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you just walked in the door. And if you could code and you could use the tools, you got the job, got the job. Right? right? So that's what happens at the end, is that competency can be measured, competency matters, companies also, competencies change. And so we have to create a back and forth between business and, and the community. So you can actually decode what's happening at these institutions around competencies. And we're working on that. The second way to do it is all these disruptors, right? You're all, we're all disruptors. My last um, commencement at Occidental College, which was one of Marjorie's colleges, um, a kid walks across, my, one of my favorite students walks across the stage, I shake his hand, I give him his diploma, the you know, camera clicks, and he said, could we do that again? I said, uh, his name was Ben. <laughs> ben, well, why, did your aunt miss the photo? And he said, no, while I was doing my Oxy undergraduate, Oxy College, while I was doing my undergrad, I also um, did MIT's open courseware uh, degree in mechanical engineering, and I'm not going to get a handshake for that. <laughs> <laughs> I left higher education and started uh, investing in ed tech yeah. the next fall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, because that's what this is about. It's about blending these things together. Right. So the University of Texas this year, and I promise I'll stop, the University of Texas this year announced that it was going to use um, Google's certificates mounted on Coursera, given ACE credit, to fit into their undergraduates' um, transcripts. Mm -hmm. So if you're a student at any of the University of Texas campuses, you can take any of the Google certificates. We've evaluated them for credit. They become a part of your 180 degrees. It's not an either or. Right. It's a blending and a mixing. And so let's all talk about disruption, but let's all talk about where it ends, which is not with a completely different system of higher education, but it's with the current system behaving in very, very different ways. And I will add awesome. that it's not just the Googles of the world that are doing more performance-based hiring. So we have a new governor in Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. I have a new governor, Josh Shapiro. His very first executive order, weeks, you know, two weeks into his office, was to say thousands of jobs in the state of Pennsylvania that required, previously required a college degree, no longer required a college degree. 
It was now all about performance. Do you have the skills and the competencies you need to be able to do this job? If so, then you get the job. And so he called me up right away and said, well, are you okay with this? Yeah. You know, are, you, are you okay that we're going to be hiring <laughs> right. a lot of people who are definitely not graduates of colleges and universities? And I'm, of course I'm okay with it because that's what we're talking about right. here today. How do we meet that need of the skills and the competencies and still be able to provide to society and use the technological pathways and satisfy our mission of access? So we have to be able to do all of that together. Well, and but I think it's, it's also going to it will remain change the to be economics. seen, I think, whether or not that actually does open pathways. Because even developing the skills is hard if you're hungry. It's hard if you've just been evicted. Yeah. Yep. Right. It's hard if you are a single parent. Yeah. So right. we still have a lot to prove, I think, that, that there are other pathways. John, go for it. And the, say something about AI. So yeah. I, 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 box <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll build on that like, after. after yeah. Somewhere along the way, to too, success, right? access, just say it. <laughs> to some degree, there are two ways to think about disruption. One of them is curricular. And the coming of badges, right? We've been hearing about it for a couple decades now. Ah, we don't need these degrees, we need badges. And we're still saying it. And we've, I think at some point, we're gonna have to have an appeal to the facts and then move on. That they're actually chunking skills into some recognizable form has value. Yeah. I'm skeptical that's gonna be where the innovation happens. I'm much more thought, uh, I, I think a lot more about the fact that technology rewards scale. Mm -hmm. It has a high upfront cost, it has low marginal cost, and you either, in that case, have to become very large or you have to network really effectively. You have to collaborate at scale. And the schools that don't do one or the other are gonna die. Mm -hmm. right. And that's gonna be the disruption, is watching schools either either uh, disappear or merge, um, or find ways to network that are much more effective than what we've been doing so far. And yeah. the curricular stuff will happen, and now an ad for large language models. I think if you look at every single uh, change like this, K-12 doesn't know what to do with it, tries to ban it, and higher ed ends up embracing it uh, much more quickly. You'll see uh, uh, AI Thank you. integrate itself into just about every course. And you know the mantra that I have heard and love is you're not going to be replaced with AI. You're going to be replaced by somebody who knows AI. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And how we bring up graduates who are that guy uh, is, I think, where the game is going to yeah. get played. So, so maybe I, I, I want to just build on that, because I think what, what, what John said right now is really crucial. And I think it is shared by everybody on the panel. But I think if you were to hear what we've been saying, it sounds like we're saying everything is going to be all right. Everything is not going to be all right for any given institution, yeah. mm -hmm. right? The sector may or may not survive. I'm not quite sure that it will. I hope it will. But there is a difference between reform and disruption. Disruptors do not want the higher education sector to survive. They want to destroy it. That is the theory of disruption. You take the incumbent, you burn it to the ground, and you bring up something else that is better. And if we think the license Raj will protect us, I will tell you that given popular disfavor of higher education, the license Raj will be removed. And AI, which already at its current state, can pass business degree, graduate, a graduate medical degree, right, in a relatively simple fashion, the future will completely ensure that the current model will not withstand technological innovation. And so that means one of two things. It may mean that institutions will adapt to AI, embrace it, incorporate it, increase and reform what and how they teach and deliver better value for their learner, or it could be that they will resist, that they will continue to try to make money out of Bio 101 and Econ 101 and all of the cash machines they currently produce. We don't make A disruptor that doesn't care about reforming those institutions will rise up, provide undeniably better value, undeniably better connections to work, employment, eventually to graduate schools, to the license, and will disrupt the sector. Okay, we have uh, 35 seconds. We're gonna do lightning round, last question. 
Give us your best prediction on the one big change we will see, good or bad. Uh, hopefully, think about positivity when it comes to the state of higher education when we're back here at ASU GSV in 2030. That's like a one sentence answer, or I'm going to stump everyone. I know you have yeah. something to say. Who wants to start? I'll go first. Yeah. John. 90% of graduate programs will be online. Mm -hmm. Wow. Next. I, this may be just to sort of um, touch on a point you just made. I, I would agree that disruption uh, burns and replaces. I would say it replaces with something different, not necessarily better, or better in certain ways, often worse in other ways. Look at the newspaper industry, right? We don't have local investigative reporting anymore, or we have very, very little of it. We've got a lot more corruption that we're only, you know, we only find out about candidates once they've been elected, et cetera. So different, journalism is different now. It's better in some ways, worse in some ways. I think the same will be true in education. It will be different, it will be better, and it will be worse in some ways. If this brave new future uh, cares about scale, then it will mean that um, students who really benefit from one-on-one, -on -one, face to face student by student may not benefit. It also means that many of the things that colleges traditionally do that are not only not valued by business or those who have currently have power, but are actively discouraged and discredited um, will become rarer and rarer. And that will be different. Okay. Maybe better in certain ways. Definitely worse in other ways. Okay. I know David's going to get of us either the stun gun, the water gun, the ejector <laughs> seat. So I want the last, last three left to the, the one big thing. What do you I'll predict? say by, by 2030, you will see uh, the beginning of dozens of higher education programs that will be demonstrably superior to any current uh, higher education outcome institutions. And I would say, I teach a course, a, a case right now. Uh, Amazon is spending a billion dollars in the next five years to retrain the people that they already have. Right. Google's doing the opposite. They're getting rid of their full-time employers and they're going to the gig economy to get just-in-time knowledge and skills. What's not answered, you, the question is, who's gonna win? Is it keeping your existing people or is it going to the gig economy? Mm -hmm. We can have a lot of discussion about that. The question I have is, where is higher ed? in that equation. So mm -hmm. my prediction in the next five years is that higher ed will be in both places. We will be training the gig economy and we will be training those who are doing in-house corporate training mm -hmm. for survival. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Learners will own their own learning record mm -hmm. and it will be an amalgam of things that they learn in things we call institutions today that they learn online and they learn from their employer but they will self be self-sovereign documents yeah. owned and controlled by learners themselves. Fantastic, Great. it's called empowerment. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Great. Wonderful panel. Really See you back in 2030 to see awesome. if your predictions are right. Thank you, everyone.